Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show where we talk about the spiritual side of life, death, and also experiences somewhere in between. My name's Kirsty Salisbury, the host of your show, and I hope that you'll find huge value in the conversations that I host, the research that I'm doing, and the discussions that we hear on the show. There's also the VIP community, where you can join for more in-depth discussion. We have online events, we have workbooks, we have topics, mantras, journaling, behind-the-scenes content, so many extras. And you can do that by going over to www.letstalkneardeath.com. But first, let's get into this episode. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. A slightly different episode today. It's not a solo episode. I'm not interviewing a near death experiencer. I'm chatting with fellow NDE podcaster, Chaz Hathaway. Chaz is the author of Life in the Spirit World, What Near-Death Experiences May Teach About Life on the Other Side. He's also the host of the Near-Death Experience podcast, and he's been spending quite a bit of time over the last few years reading, researching, interviewing, and putting amazing conversations out into the world. I'm not quite sure what's in store for today. We're going to have an amazing conversation. So buckle in. I hope that you enjoy this and I hope that you find value in this episode. So Chaz, I know that you're the host of the Near Death Experience podcast. How did you get into this? How did that all start? The way I I got started with this is it was probably 10 plus years ago that I first really started discovering near-death experiences. Now, I grew up being aware of them in the background. My grandma had a near-death experience that I had heard, mm. I don't want to say whispers of, but I, you know, heard from the family that, you know, she had this experience of being out of her body when, you know, she was, uh, she coded and, and so forth. And, and it was this kind of like, wow, this is cool, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, cool, you know, but never really knew much more about it than that. I knew of people having seen lights or going through tunnels, but I never really gave it much thought other than, uh, other than I believe it, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm sure that does happen, you know, sure. Mm-hmm. Why not? I'm, I'm a spiritual guy. I am religious all my life. I believe in life before life as well as life after life. So it was just kind of a, a given you're like, okay. But then I, I just started feeling really curious about it. Really curious about the details. Cause you know, you read from, the Bible, from from various uh, religious uh, writings about heaven, and it's like, okay, I you know I believe in heaven, but what does that mean? What does it look like? What mm. you know? What does it smell like? Or is there a smell? What you know? And, and I just didn't know, and I was curious, and and so I started poking around in these near death experiences simply because these were people that had generally had no agenda. They were just like, this happened. I don't know what's going on, but here it is, you know, and they're just mm-hmm. kind of laying it as it is. And so I started looking into it and my, my initial response was, whoa, this is really interesting. And then as I read three or four more, I started realizing, whoa, there's like a lot of stuff here. You, this isn't just kind of going through this vague tunnel and seeing a light and then appearing back in the body. This is like, you know, they're describing individual people that they're talking to conversations Mm -hmm. they're having um talking about seeing seeing landscapes and and just i mean it it didn't take long to start seeing details that i was just like holy mackerel what in the world Mm -hmm. so then i got really deep and i i just sucked up anything i could find um one of the first books that i read was uh Daniel Brinkley, or yeah, Daniel yeah. Brinkley, uh, um, Saved by the Light. And that just blew my mind, you know, not just the experience itself, which did blow my mind, but the after effects and stuff. I was like, what is going on here? I don't know if I'm ready to accept this. This is a lot to take in, you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, but as I dug deeper, I found this is happening all over the world to thousands and thousands of people on a daily basis. It, you can't just ignore it. And, and I got so excited and, and was, you know, pretty much every conversation that I was having with everybody, I was like, you got to hear this. I heard the coolest story. And they're just like, okay, 
we heard the last five stories you told us, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so I was getting to the point where I had so much in my head about this stuff and I had to get it out there and I was annoying everyone I knew. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, okay, uh, I just need to unload. I need to put this out there. And I'd done several other kinds of podcasts before. And I was like, let's just put it out on a podcast. I'm just going to make, you know, I, I think I'd committed myself to 12 episodes because I knew, you know, with these chunks of material that I got, I've got to put this out there. And if nobody ever sees it, at least it's out there. And I can pa- tell my kids, if you want to know what I, <laughs> what I learned, yeah. here it is, you know, kind of thing. And so I, I set out to do these 12 episodes and I did. and. uh and by maybe the seventh or eighth episode, and I was putting these out like every day. I was just like, I'm just going to do oh, one wow. a day to get yeah. this out, you know. And as soon as the episode, I started getting contacts from people. And they're like, holy, thank you for doing this. This this is, is totally changing my perspective. And I'm like, I mean, I've done podcasts and it's like months before you start getting views, at least for me, because I, mm. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like, okay, you know, let's do this. And, and, and so I was like, well, let's keep it up for a while and just see, see where it goes. And of course, all this while I'm studying deeper and digging deeper in, into the stuff. And it became this uh, really fun exploration for me. For me, I don't feel at all like an expert. I feel like a student that is Partially. really delved yeah. into it. And, and it's like, I mean, how can anybody be an expert on the other side? I mean, we're all here stuck on this hmm. earth. We don't know, you know, <laughs> and the ones who have been there are like, holy moly, I got to tell you all this stuff. And then other people are like, well, I saw this and this, which is even different and even more. So it's like, everybody's got these individualized experiences and it's so amazing. And so I'm like, okay, you know what? We're all students. We're all trying yeah. to figure this out together. So that, that was my approach and how I got started. I would love to hear your how you guys started. Oh, I love that. I just want to go back and say I totally agree with you because, yeah, I get people who talk to me as if I know what I'm doing or I have a better understanding for any reason I'm going. I, I don't. I, I don't get it. But it's so interesting. I'm like you now. I just there's so much I want to go into and it's quite hard to actually focus on one particular part of it because what I'm finding is that the conversation is expanding so much as I'm learning, like the topics are opening up and things that I potentially didn't even think about or believe in a little while back, they keep showing up in the conversation. I'm starting to realize, that, oh, that's actually connected to that because over here we have this part and seeing that they are connected. So the conversation is getting much bigger for me, which is kind of exciting, kind of overwhelming. And, you know, it's all part of that fun journey, but I'm like you as well. Just love the content, love the conversations, just love to hear all of the unique stories and then see the themes that are running through, I think is really interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my story started, I had my near death experience. I was 12 years old. I was having brain surgery, flatlined on the table, um, had, had a really unusual experience that I didn't quite know what to do with. And then Fast forward a few years from that, quite a few years, uh, 27 years, because I didn't know what to do with my experience. I held it all in. I then was driving my car and I'd always lived a life. I live by my heart. I live by my spirit. I live by my gut feelings. And I've been told so many times that I need to pay attention to what's logical and, you know, all these types of things. And I'm going, I just don't know if I can live that way. It just doesn't resonate with me. And so many times I look through my life and I've made enormous decisions, like life-changing decisions based on how I felt that day or based on what my gut feel was after I'd had lunch. And it's, you know, logically it makes no sense. And I've been told a few times not to live that way, but I just can't shake it. So I'm driving my car and I'm getting this feeling that something's brewing for a few days beforehand, driving my car. And I literally have this internal kind of like explosion of a voice saying, I want you to go and interview near-death experiences. And I hadn't shared my story at the time. I wasn't open about it. I was not looking to pursue any of the work that I've done recently. And it kind of shook my world because I went, oh, no, no, that, that's just silly. But it came back again. And it's the voice that has led me through these massive decisions time and time again in my life of it's always right. It's always when I follow the voice, I have the most fun, the most adventure, Things work out. It's not always the straightaway, the easy path, but I followed the voice in the end. I knew that I couldn't get away from it. I knew that I had to do it. And I'm talking an internal voice. 
people often ask me, did you hear it physically? Was it in your ear? I actually don't know. That's the thing. It was so encompassing, so overwhelming that I don't know whether I audibly heard it or if it was just so big inside of me, but I can't deny it. And so I followed it. I ended up like you going out, doing a couple of interviews and I was looking to do the bare minimum. I was looking to how do I just tick this off and then carry on with my real life because my life wasn't going to be about NDE research or interviewing people or podcasting or any of that stuff. So I was like, right, I'll do just a couple, get it out of the way, and then I can go back to living the life that I was living. And as I started, just like you started to put episodes out, then more people started to come along and it started to grow wheels. People started to actually listen to what I was saying. I'm going, what the heck? People are listening to me. That was a little bit overwhelming, a bit scary, because I was thinking, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And it just took on from there. And then now, gosh, I've released... I've released over a hundred episodes, but I've interviewed so, so many more people and just the stories just keep coming time and time again. And what's exciting is to see some of the newer stories that are coming out now, especially with COVID, some of the, yeah, the newer ones where the themes are still the same, the experiences are still the same, even though so much has changed from the time when I had my own experience. So yeah, that's how I got into it. It's been the most amazing ride. It's been very bumpy, very up and down. And a lot of, I feel like I'm just jumping off a cliff with no clue what I'm doing. And yeah, like you say, we're all students. We we never get to the point where we actually get this. Because I think yeah. if we get there, then we've completely not got it at all. I think that we've totally misunderstood. It's an evolving journey. Like I say, the topics are opening up. I'm now... I've been heavily involved with IONS. I'm now on the board with the Spiritual Awakenings International Association, which is amazing. And, you know, the conversation's just evolving so much. So I'm having a great time. But you, you've you written some books, haven't you? Yeah, I, uh, I, I've i written one on near-death experiences, and I've written several others on, on various topics, uh, such as music, uh, religion, and so forth. But I have one on uh, near death experiences and i and my goal with that was to just really just give a nice you know this is far as we can tell from near death experiences this is what the other side looks like so so that's that's been a fun uh fun journey i would like to hear if if you don't mind um more about your near death experience how old were you and and what happened okay so i was 12 I just had my 12th birthday three weeks earlier. I was a competitive gymnast and that was just my life. Everything I did was around this goal that I had to do really well and compete really high level in gymnastics. I hit my head on the bars um, Mm -hmm. straight, sort of on the front. It was a metal bar. I was in the school playground at the time. And yeah, it wasn't even the actual in the gymnastics club or anything like that. I was in the school playground at lunchtime. I hit my head on the bar didn't think much of it, went back to class, didn't really think much at all. And then within, it was probably about 48 hours, I started to get quite a bad headache. I started to feel real lethargic and tired. And I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, oh, I'm either coming down with something or I'm training too hard because I had a big competition coming up. So I went to bed. The short story is that I woke up a few hours later, I had this enormous headache and it was like specific, it was right here. I don't know if you're not if you can see it on the video, but right here, it was just this most overwhelming pinpointed pain. And then um, from there, I ended up losing my mobility. So Mm -hmm. my mother came in and found me. I was on the floor. I wasn't feeling too well. I couldn't move properly. And I was very, very confused, but I was just overwhelmed by this pain. Mm -hmm. Um, I then heard a voice tell me not to go to sleep. And I believe the voice is very strongly connected to the one that I've talked about when I was driving my car. It feels very familiar not to go to sleep, to stay awake, which I didn't really understand. And I was so, so tired. I was trying to stay awake. And obviously I didn't stay awake. I fell into quite a deep coma. So the next morning, my parents couldn't wake me up and I got rushed off to the hospital. That's where they realized that I had an AVM on my brain, which is an arterial venous malformation, which basically means that my brain hadn't formed correctly. It was kind of like having aneurysms. That's the ones that they develop. So basic, if you imagine I had aneurysms in my head, but my ones were there from birth. So the bump to the head when I hit my head on the bar was quite likely something that just dislodged something or triggered something to happen. 
And then from then on, my my brain it had a brain bleed, so I had a brain hemorrhage. And then they went and operated, and they found a massive tangle of malformation, I suppose, just this tangle of stuff. And then I flatlined on the operating table while they're trying to remove this because where it was was quite deep. It wasn't surface level, so it was quite hard to get to. Flatlined on the table. They brought me back. They carried on. I flatlined again. They brought me back and then they aborted the surgery. They said, this is too dangerous. She will not make it if we, she keeps flatlining. So they aborted the surgery. And then I woke up about a week later, or five or six days later in the critical care unit. And I had tubes everywhere. Everything was going on. But my experience was somewhere in that time. I can't pinpoint where. I found myself in a void, like a black, empty space. And I could hear my father's voice talking to me. I couldn't find my father. It was like I was there alone, but he was there. He was just kind of behind me. I could never see him and I was trying to connect with him. I couldn't connect with him. I couldn't find him. He was asking me to squeeze his hand. I couldn't do that. Was your I was just gonna ask if your father was alive at this time, but it sounds like yeah. Yeah, if he's holding Yeah, no, he okay. was. This is the interesting thing. My father was alive, which makes the whole thing even more confusing. And I believe that I've worked it out since then. Mm-hmm. But he was he was alive at the time. And I felt this overwhelming responsibility that the world would not be the same if I didn't squeeze his hand, if I didn't connect with him in some way. And that sounds so crazy, but I just had to do it. So I'm trying to connect with him. I then get to the point where the responsibility feels so huge that it's actually bigger than whether I stay alive or not. I don't realize where I am. There's a lot of confusion in my NDE. I don't quite understand what's going on. So anyway, I I decide that I'll give everything I can to connect with him because I have to, like I just have to. I go to try and connect with him and then I count down three, two, one, give everything I've got. And then there's just this bright white light that just encompasses me. There's white light everywhere. It's beautiful. There's like vibrations, waves of just amazingness it's I I don't know if it's love I don't know if it's music I feel like there was music there I feel like I was just being embraced I was in this most beautiful beautiful place and I was like wow this is amazing wasn't so confused I was still confused but I was just focused on this light just focused on where I was it was amazing and I noticed that around me were some beings They were silhouette beings. I don't know who they were. I don't know what they were. They seemed to be human shaped. They seemed to be, I don't know, um, yeah, like shoulders and head. I didn't really, it was sort of shoulders up that I, sorry, stomach up that I really saw them. Very confusing for me. And then I was thinking my natural reaction was, I wonder who they are. What are these? And I tried to focus in and I couldn't focus in on any details. And I Mm. felt that I wasn't permitted to see the details. Mm. And I tried again and again, and I was kind of looking around trying to get the details of these, I'm going to call them silhouette beings. And yeah, I knew that I couldn't, I knew that I wasn't allowed to know who they were. And yet I kept trying. And then I don't know if it's because I was being a bit um, stubborn trying to find out whether I got sent back because I was pushing too hard or what it was. But the next thing I know is I'm waking up in my body. So I don't remember coming back into my body. I don't remember leaving my body. I remember just being in this place. And then the transition was just like everything opened up from this darkness where there was absolutely nothing to this light where it was just beautiful. So that's my experience. I woke up um, to some very intense physical challenges, I suppose. I was paralyzed down one side of my body. I'd had brain surgery. I had all sorts of things. And they hadn't actually fixed the problem because they had aborted the surgery because it was too dangerous. So then I woke up to all these challenges and I felt like my life was perfect. I felt like my life was just absolutely exactly how it needed to be. Despite people going, yeah, it's looking pretty grim and you know, you're going to have to learn to walk again if you can walk and you're going to have to learn how to live and you can't be alone and there's tubes everywhere and all these things. And I was going, life is exactly how it needs to be. And I have to say, I've lived life at a pretty fast pace since then. I love to connect. So I'm all about connecting spiritually, but I'm also about having this physical experience that we're in. So it's kind of a two-way thing. I get, I can get myself quite confused in that process 
of how do I live more spiritually and slow down and connect more? And then how do I make the most out of this physical experience that I'm in and why I'm here and things like that. So I love, you know, I get quite confused in life. It's quite a challenge to actually find that balance, but yeah, I mean, from what I can tell, yeah, Go ahead. from what I can tell of all of these experiences and all the interviews that I've done is that it's all coming back to love. It's all about love, loving yourself, loving people, yeah. living with intention and integrity and doesn't mean we can't have a whole lot of fun along the way. And I think that is the most fun life when we can submit and surrender, we can have the most fun in life. So life's Mm. pretty good. It doesn't mean I'm not looking forward to going back, but life is what we make it. Oh, that is so beautiful. It's Uh, cool, huh? (laughs) Oh, interesting. Yes, it is. Amazing. You know, it's interesting when you described uh, not being able to make out the details on and so many near-death experiences people will say i couldn't make out the face i couldn't make out some of them would yeah. even say they didn't have faces and and i've wondered for uh, a lot you know from a lot of these you know why exactly but you offer an interesting perspective on that that somehow you weren't permitted to there was I, you know mm-hmm. whether it was you know it would have made it harder for you to come back or whether you know something about making out those details it wasn't right for you at the time. And I wonder if that's a common thing among those who don't get those details that they're trying to get. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's your natural reaction is to look like if you see something, if you see someone yeah. you're looking at them and if you can't, it's kind of natural reaction to look a little bit harder. Yeah. But especially yeah, if yeah, you're I, feeling confused like that and you're like, what's going on? I'm not sure. Did you, could you remember your life? at the time or was it more like I had no not clue. sure who I am or what's going on <laughs> I was totally in the moment I wasn't thinking about anything I was quite confused oh I'll come back to my father actually because that's the missing piece so I woke up and I was like oh so you know you see in the movies when people come in and they've got their loved one by their bedside and they're holding their hand and saying can you hear me and they're stroking their hand you know squeeze my hand if you can hear me I just assumed that that's what had happened I assumed that my father had been there saying, you know, come on, you've got to make it come through, pull through. And so I didn't think too much of that, but I did ask him, I said, I remember you being there. And he said, what? And I said, I remember you being there and squeezing my hand and asking me to squeeze your hand. And he said, no, no, I wasn't there. And it turns out he hadn't gone into my room because he was so devastated. I mean, like I've got this cool story, but I think about my parents and I think, wow, what they went through. If my daughter went through anything, I mean, the amount that they went through is just, I often said when I was younger, it was worse. It was harder for my parents than it was for me Uh because yes, I had all sorts of stuff and, you know, it still continues to today. But to see your own child like that would just be so devastating. So yeah. anyway, he hadn't been in, he hadn't sat with me, but what he said was, but do you remember? And we had this family friend, I won't say their name, who came in and did exactly that, sat with me when I was in the coma and sat with me and stroked my hand and said, you know, it told me all about her trip. She had been on a trip to Europe, told me all about things going on in her day and just sat there talking to me. And I said, I've got no memory. I just remember you being there. And he says, but I wasn't, I wasn't there. So I don't know about that. As time's gone on, I suspect he's part of my team. I suspect the beings that I saw around me are part of my spiritual team, whether that's my guides or angels or past loved ones who are part of my soul group or whatever. I actually don't understand, but I suspect that my father was one of those. So if I went this time, he would have been one of those silhouettes. There might be one more. I believe we're connected on some level and he's, he's part of my immediate team so I you know, think that's that, where that comes from yeah you know and that makes me think too you know we, w- one of the things that kind of blew me away in in studying near-death experience is this idea of bi-attentional you know or multi-attentional capacity of our spirits and and you know for us in the mortal life that just doesn't even make sense i mean if we're a multitasker that's amazing but it's not the same thing <laughs> as mm. being able to actually kind of in some spiritual way be in two places at once and yet in the spirit realm that seems to be somehow the case and mm. i remember 
uh, reading one experience. Um, if I can remember the the name of the author is John Pontius. If I can remember the name of the book. Um, anyway, he's he's having this near death experience. He's in the hospital, being operated on flat lines, whatever, and he's wandering around the hospital. And he goes and he finds his wife there, and he he wants to communicate with her and some somehow and say, I'm okay. I'm okay. Which of course, from a moral perspective, he's really not, right? Yeah, <laughs> he's not totally. okay. He's outside <laughs> his body, but you know, his spirit doesn't, isn't thinking that way. It's like, Oh no, I'm okay. You know? And so, and so she, he gets close and he senses intuitively that to enter another person's body um, requires permission, that it's something that is very deeply personal and and requires permission to do so he he kind of asks her as a as a way of just you know come to tell you i'm okay kind of thing and he gets a response from her yes you may and of course her body is sitting there just like in turmoil she's she's not paying attention she can't doesn't know what's going on with him but somehow her spirit is able to communicate with him and say yes it's okay. And then of course, when he comes in and, and I think he even just kind of um, passes part of him through her and he's suddenly enveloped with this entire sensation of being what it's like to be her, what it's like to be a woman, what it's like to be his wife, what it's like to be a mother and what she's going through right now. And, and, even though he tries to say I'm okay and everything, he realizes that her physical body is not getting it and he can't get the message across, but you know, her spirit knows deep down, but she's going to have to get quiet before she's going to understand it is kind of the, what he got out of it. But, uh, but the thing that that made me think of the reason that made me think of that when you were describing it is it makes me think that sometimes I wonder if when we're on, on this side, say we have a, someone at a hospital or we just, you know, they've flatlined something or we have some connection. It may even not be at the same time. I don't know, but we may mentally kind of reach out and, you know, kind of mentally hold someone's hand. And, and I can imagine your dad, for example, just kind of saying, please don't go, don't go, you know, not even in the room and all that. And it makes me wonder if that, whatever that spiritual ability is to be, sort of in two places at once or have two um, things going on at once part of him maybe was with you there in the void while the other part is in turmoil in the hospital mm. i don't know it's just you know it's, it's so interesting hearing this stuff though totally and that's a very good example of how i was saying the conversation expands because you start to ask mm -hmm. these questions and then that comes back to can we be living in multiple places? Are there parallel universes? You know, are we in different time zones? The conversation just gets bigger and bigger. So I love what you say there. Quite possibly, he was actually in all places all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe a percentage of us, this is what I've been looking at in more detail recently, a percentage of us comes into our body to incarnate. And the rest of it is our either incarnating somewhere else or yeah. it's up in we say up, but in this other place where it's in between, maybe that's where we go, where that's where the white light is. Maybe that's where our, our soul group is. We, we don't know how much we incarnate into this current lifetime. And yeah. then you see um, the examples of things like doppelgangers or where people mm -hmm. believe that they're living two lifetimes. And I'm not talking about people who potentially get diagnosed as schizophrenic or something like that where they genuinely believe that they're living multiple lives or maybe they don't actually know it. I mm -hmm. talked, it was Dr. Yvonne Kaysen actually, who believes that she's met another example, another part of herself in this current lifetime. Now this blows my oh. mind. And this is where that conversation just gets so much bigger. And yeah, I sometimes I think, man, what do I even believe? Like, what am I nuts? Am I just like, this stuff sounds crazy. But as you research it and you go into it and you actually take time to learn more, it starts to work. It starts to connect. So, yeah, it's interesting. So many different parts of that. So I can see what you're saying there. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's, uh, that's been my kind of approach with you know, I, I kind of got to a point where I kept running into these things. It's like, wait a minute, but that I, in this experience, they had this, but this, you know, and, and I've kind of found 
a place that just makes things seem to work for me. And that's, that's that whenever I come across a question of, is it this or is it this nine times out of 10, it's actually both. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. in some way or another, it's both. And, yeah. and so it's like, Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if that's the case, guy's the limit, you know? And so well, totally. it's, it, Blows my mind. Blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I'm, I go a little bit easier on myself that I don't need to understand it all. That if it doesn't make sense, if I feel like I need, need to choose between two things, I'll actually just park them both over here. And then chances are yeah. later down the track, I go, oh, that was related to that bit there. So I'll bring that back in. And then the understanding, it's like bits of a puzzle. It starts to sort of come together. So yeah, yeah, yeah we can't understand everything all at once. And if I look at how my thoughts and things have evolved since I've been doing this work. It's enormous. Like it's, it's just crazy. The stuff I would never believe the stuff a while back, but now I've got a lot of backing behind it to actually make me go, okay, no, this does make sense. And now I do believe it not because I've been talked into it, but I've done the research and now that's a viable option for me. So super interesting. You Uh, talked about how a lot of stuff sorry no sorry go ahead <laughs> you get two interviewers together right <laughs> a little bit of a lag but my, yeah. probably my internet <laughs> that's okay that's fine well um, I think were- it's partly because you're in your death experience or, and, and so you're creating these these electro problems <laughs> no. yeah. nothing to do with yeah, me I although care. it happens quite uh, a bit now <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You get a bunch of people, like you get a group of experiences on and anything can go wrong. Like you just have, you have no idea what you're in for. Yeah. Technology just doesn't want to play. Yeah. Cause have you had an experience? I have not had my own near death experience. No, I've had what I kind of consider thin veil experiences where I've had, you know, the, the sense that, you know, uh, a loved one is communicating something with me or that, or that maybe maybe I've had, you know, I've had several dreams, for example, where I see a dead loved one and we talk and it's this beautiful, like, you know, bawling kind of experience, so beautiful and everything. And then I wake up and it's, it's just a dream. And yet I feel that it's more than a dream, you know? And so I've had lots of things that make me think that veil is very thin, but I have not had my own near-death experience. However, what I find really interesting about this is once I started really diving into this, I started noticing kind of odd little things. Um, I don't, I, I, at the time I had no idea how to describe them or, or, you know, how to quantify them. But then I started coming up uh, across this idea of after effects that somebody comes back from a near death experience. And now there's certain things that are just a little bit different for them, either, either in their interactions with others, maybe the way they connect em- empathically with them and so forth. And what I've noticed is just diving into this near death experience stuff and really um, being willing to accept a lot of it and be you know, curious enough to keep, keep digging into it. I found my own, a little bit after effects going on. And it makes me think maybe there's something about spiritual awakening at that level that, Mm -hmm. uh, that actually opens up certain things. Most of it kind of makes sense spiritually. And then there's stuff like, you know, as we joked about the electromagnetic sensitivity, I, I I can't use Android phones. I don't know what the problem is. Everybody says <laughs> it's it, it's it's because you're getting the cheap ones. Well, I've tried the expensive ones. Which I don't know. I can't figure it out. So I was like, you know what? My last resort. I'm going to try an iPhone. And if that don't work, I'm done with phones. This is ridiculous, you guys. And and so far, it's been good for me. I think it, yeah. it's working so much better. And I don't know what iPhone phone does or Apple does differently. I'm not trying to push iPhones, but for some reason, it works. It's just you know, but I'm like, I don't remember having that be a problem when I was growing up as a kid. I don't remember having weird things like that. I mean, I was always kind of a dreamer in the sense that I would have spiritual type dreams, but, but beyond that, I don't, you know, some of that kind of stuff, it just kind of started once I really started digging into near-death experiences. And it makes me wonder if there's something to getting into this stuff that actually opens that side of the spiritual nature totally I don't doubt it because I think when we open we change our frequency and it's you know we become more open to having connection with the other side to 
all sorts of things. And I have spoken to many near-death experiences who don't have those after effects. Well, maybe they haven't stepped in. I think there's an element of stepping into them. There's an element of understanding. For some people, it's really obvious you can't deny them. If you're walking down Mm -hmm. the street and all the streetlights are going out above you or, you know, if... (sighs) If all of these random things are happening and you absolutely can't deny it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know a few people can do that actually. Well, not can do it, where that happens. Yeah. I think there's this after effects which you can't deny, but I think some of them it's about growing and learning and understanding and learning how to use those new abilities. And I think that's the same with anybody. I don't think we need to have a near-death experience to step into those giftings. And, you know, like I I quite often say, I don't really have any after effects. And it's not until we nut down, I go, oh, yeah, that happens for me. And then I realize, oh, I do have some. But actually, I, yeah, I don't know. But I I think we can learn. We can, if we're open and we connect spiritually, I think if we take the time to try and grow who we are spiritually, that it's just something that happens. It's one of the the results of doing that. And and all of us can become more open. uh, one of the really obvious ones that most people don't think of as an after effect, but when you look at the world around you, how incredibly um, big it really is. And that's a lack of a fear of death. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I have yet to meet uh, just a few that have had only seriously distressing near death experiences, which are not very many, but uh, aside from them, Everybody else is like, I'm ready to go any day. I've got things to do. I'm not in a hurry about it. But when my time comes, I'm like, see ya. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, yeah. you know, gonna gonna fight to come back because I want I'd rather be there, but I recognize I need to be here right now. So I'm sticking with this, but they have no fear of death. And I think yeah. that's probably I, you know, it's it's something that's easily overlooked just because you know, well, of course you're not afraid, but when you talk to other people, uh, you know. People are scared of death. They're really afraid. And even if they if they're vaguely, you know, comfortable with the idea of of you know getting to heaven and so forth, often um they're afraid of the process. Is it gonna hurt to die? And and I have yet to meet somebody who, you know, lots of people have pain up to that point, but at that point of death, it's always this incredible release where it's like oh okay thank you it's all that pain just goes away Mm. and sometimes the transition is even so peaceful that i mean um sharon milliman comes to mind she she had a a drowning experience and and she's in the water and she I, i think she had a cramp or something that made her go under and and she says she's swimming and she's having this panic moment like oh my gosh you know and all of a sudden she realized wait a minute I can breathe underwater. My parents have been lying to me all these years. You can breathe yeah. underwater and look how beautiful this water is. These beautiful fish and, and this, this, you know, it suddenly becomes very picturesque and everything and things are changing. And she's just like, this is cool. <laughs> you yeah. know. And, and I think that tends to be people's experiences with death is that it's not painful. The, the moments leading up can be very, very painful, mm. but it seems even in terms of pain, there's much more of it coming back. <laughs> it's it's when they oh, get back in their yeah. body, it's like wham, and then it hurts. And so, you know, don't worry because come it's gonna hurt a lot. <laughs> if you do revive them, it, it'll hurt a lot more. But if if it's their time to go, it's okay to let go because it's uh it's going to it's not going to hurt at all. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying. It's so interesting because part of what I'm researching at the moment where I'm sort of looking around is these death experiences where potentially people don't come back, where we actually die and stay dead. And there are some beautiful stories of people where for a couple of days it takes it takes a couple of days for that full death process to kick in. And in that time, they're going between two worlds, that they're in that place that you're talking about where it's glorious and beautiful and hey, look at the water, look around me, look, this is amazing. And then back into the physical body where it's painful, it's restrictive and it's hard. And definitely, I think for the person, there comes that moment when you're that far through the death process that actually it's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting, isn't it? So Chaz, the question that I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you'd written a book about... Did you say you'd written a book about religion? 
Um, so I've I've got a uh, several books. I'm I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Um, grew up in the church all all my life, and and I'm still a strong faithful member of the church. And within that faith, I've written several books, especially for youth, kind of kind of the kind of uh, books that uh, would be written for like youth camp, kind of you know fun, you know um, encouraging. Uh, people to stay close to God and, and, you know, kids and so forth. A book on dating, for example, and and a a book on, uh, actually wrote one that's more of a humor type book with, you know, some religious uh, um, tones to it that's about uh, uh, having young children, um, which was a really fun book to write because at the time I had three kids under the age of five or no, under the age of six. And, and so I was just totally living that life, you know? And, and so that was a lot of fun. So I've, so that's another one. Um, I've, I'm working now on a book on, uh, on, um, forest gardening, which is, is kind of a permaculture, sustainable agriculture type of a book. So you might say that I have my, uh, interests in a lot of different fields <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, that's so. cool that's really cool I like that I think we need to check out lots of different things in life definitely yeah, yeah yeah so do you think that was that the right way that you were raised is in the church and with the belief system that you have yeah in fact that's been an interesting journey for me especially studying the uh, all this stuff with near-death experiences because you know many near-death experiences uh, come back and say, okay, I'm writing off religion entirely. I'm, I'm done. You know, yeah, And that's yeah. a very common response. But then there are others who um, come back even stronger in their faith than they were before. And most tend to come back a little more liberal in their views and a little bit more accepting of other, uh, other religions and so forth, but feeling very much closer to God, very much closer to spirit and, and so forth. And my journey, I feel like has been one of expanding my views um, while feeling even closer to my faith in so many ways. And, Mm. and it's, it kind of, I kind of think of religion a little bit like marriage, because you talk to somebody who's you know, a couple that's been married for 50 years and you're, everybody's like, how do you do it? Because that is amazing. And it's like this incredible thing. And then there's others that, you know, they've been through six marriages and they're done. They've written off marriage and it's done. And I kind of feel like, like religion is a little bit like that in a lot of ways there. If you can find the right one for you, it can be this beautiful, deeply life um, guiding experience, this life, you know, uh, thing that a relationship, it really is a relationship. And yet, if you find that um, it's just not clicking for you, that's okay, too. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's okay. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're very open to, you know, we, we, we love everyone. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I kind of feel like I've got a good marriage with my religion, you might say, and and it's been a really incredible experience for me. Um, but I also understand those who who it doesn't work out for, and and yeah. so, yeah, yeah, interesting. How do you how do you feel that the church has, I guess, what's the word, understood the work that you're doing? How have they responded to that? Have they been quite? It's actually been quite positive i you know it's okay. it's really interesting actually um i've i've done a little bit of poking into um what how different religions react to uh, near death experiences when they hear them and and it appears that um my faith the church of jesus christ of latter day saints um and spiritualism seem to be like the biggest on board that I've seen so far. And I'm sure there's plenty of others. I know there's lots, you know, in, in just about any faith, you'll find people accepting and, and willing to believe, but, you know, I, I have heard near death experiences, for example, um, um, spoken in church talks and, and sermons and so forth. Not, not like, you know, as a, as a, you know, going to hear it every week kind of thing, but it's not uncommon. And, um, 
and I think part of that is because of my faith's really um, firm belief in the idea that we lived with God before we came to earth. And then we came to this earth and then we're going to go back and live with him again. And there's this strong tide of families and extended families. In fact, you know, we have this whole genealogical program that's, that's really big and studying near death experiences. I, I, that was something that I was very comfortable coming across was this idea that people go and they're like, hello, I am your great, great grandfather. And I'm your great, great grandmother, you know, from Germany and, and, Mm -hmm. And, and I'm your, you know, your great aunt and, and so forth and your cousin and all these connections. And then, of course, tons and tons of people who they never knew on earth and never would have, but that they feel are every bit as close as any family member ever was. And so that's something that I think is very, um, I, I think that's comfortable to most members of, of my faith. I have not made a big effort to, um, to, make a big deal out of the fact that I, that I have this mm-hmm. podcast. And so I, I've never been able to do that even with other things with my life. You know, I, yeah. I have music albums for, out, for example, of my piano music and somebody will hear me playing music. And they're like, I didn't know I, that you played piano and we've known each other for 10 years, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's just kind of like, it's like, I don't know. I just never, you know, but, but, uh, but aside from that, I, so far they've been very comfortable with it. Um, those who, who are aware of what I do. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's really fun to come across somebody who is interested in it also. Cause we start geeking out about it, you know, kind of like we're having a conversation here and we're just yeah. like, ah, how cool, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. I think it's really interesting. Um, I love to ask the questions about the church. I just feel like there's so much that we need to talk about there, which is why mm. I ask these questions. Do you, how do you feel after all the interviews that you've done, the research that you've done? I mean, you've written a book about this. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? How does how does it fit in with the the salvation message? Do you feel that there is a need for salvation? What about heaven and hell? And when you hear these experiences, we're talking about connecting with past loved ones and seeing seeing angelic beings and all of these types of things. How does that fit in with not what you're told to believe, but like the the structure of the belief system of the church? Yeah, honestly, it's it's been it's been a a really interesting journey for me because I you know I know as for myself as a youth I was I was a very spiritual person I I just sensed that right from the beginning and I was this geeky kid who was raising his hand in Sunday school every week and I was just like mm-hmm. I I just loved this stuff and and um and I would say looking if I were to look back at my say fifteen year old self. I would say that's a pretty judgmental kid right there. <laughs> you know, yeah, he, yeah. he has some things to learn, you know. But as far as as the message of salvation and so forth, and and being a very devout Christian, I do feel like that Jesus Christ's role in salvation is absolutely central and paramount to everything, even though. I do recognize that in many near-death experiences, that just doesn't even come up. You know, in, in fact, I, I read an experience not too long ago where a Muslim man, um, in his experience, as he's traveling through the tunnel, just as he's going through the light, he sees it beautifully portrayed the symbols of his religion and and you know things that confirm to him that that the teachings that he's received are right and that he should be mm-hmm. following those and even on when he's talking to loved ones on the other side his father comes to him who had died years earlier and says you need to um, help your sister stay strong in the faith help her stay strong in the faith mm-hmm. and and i just that was so touching to come across that um because we do recognize that there are so many religions and, and we've been so eager as as a society to say, well, which one is right? Which ones are wrong? Which ones are lying? Which ones are, are, are are right on the ball. And I think that's the wrong focus. I don't Mm. think that's, that's the point. In fact, I think there's strong enough evidence from the experiences I've seen 
to suggest that there probably continues to be different religious ideas on the other side or different um, uh, persuasions of, uh, you know, around spirituality. And I find that so cool because if there's one thing that we've learned by becoming a global society, it's that it's the diversity is really, really healthy and, Mm -hmm. and being able to, to, come across different ideas, different belief systems, different traditions, and to be able to willingly embrace and accept those differences. Um, it just makes us better people all around. And I, and I think on some spiritual level, that's probably true. And, mm-hmm. and when it comes down to it, you talk to anybody um, about what they believe and why they believe it. You say, well, why do you believe that? Well, why do you believe that? Why do you believe that? comes back to that same thing that we keep coming across, which is love, which mm, it, it's, it's love and unity and, and this, this oneness that we're meant to have and that we should be always seeking. Mm, mm, oh, I love that. Thank you. That's really interesting. I've got a theory, which I've dabbled in and I want yeah. to run this past you just to see what you think. This is oh, not wow. a process theory. It's yeah. something which jumps into my mind quite often and it's just jumped in again. The thought that, because you were talking about how you were always spiritual, that even in Sunday school, you were the kid putting up your hand, asking the questions, that you were very much focused on this type of stuff, even when you were younger. My theory is that if we, if part of our life purpose is to have a fully spiritual experience or to grow spiritually, then we're actually born with the inclination that we're born with the curiosity to explore these topics And that's part of our purpose that we develop, just like if we have a gifting or a talent, we can develop that in life for part of our life plan. Because you see people who are completely switched off, completely ignorant and just saying, no, that's that's not real. That's not something I need to look at. You're wrong. They can be so adamant. I wonder if actually that's just because that's not part of their plan or some of the stuff that they need to go through in this lifetime. Oh, 100 about that. 100 percent. I, I really think that there's definitely something to that. I, I have thought a lot about uh, life purpose and, and about, cause there's, it, it's so interesting to me how people will have experiences and even on the other side, if they're even lucky enough to, or blessed enough or whatever to, to be told what their life purpose is, they're always made to forget it before they return. <laughs> <laughs> and they go oh, back and they're like, I know I was told what my purpose was, but I was told you will not remember this because you cannot remember it. You have to have to, uh, you know, I, I think there's there, as far as the life, our life purposes, I think there's something in us that either like, like you said, either it's so not either. It's so we're so not um, interested in that side of us that there comes a point where we have to snap and completely flip our view, which then opens us to the, to, you know, our, our real purpose, or we are born with this inclination, this interest, this draw towards something. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why you hear from so many either celebrities or athletes and so forth uh, that started their craft when they were four years old. It's Mm -hmm. because, it's part of what they came here to do and whether that purpose has directly to do with their craft or, or their thing itself. There's something about that experience of doing that, that is part of their life purpose, maybe um, reaching out as a role model to others or, or um, having an influence that can be good or perhaps having money that they can use to make a difference in people's lives. I think, I think there is a something that we come with that sticks with us throughout our lives. And, Mm. and I think that at the right time, when we're ready for it, and sometimes it takes us decades. Mm. um, Some people, it's just a natural transition, but I think if we are striving for you know, and trying to listen, like you said, that, that voice inside us that, you know, following our hunches and so forth, it, I think we naturally fall into that purpose. I think that's just what happens. 
Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with that. And what I find really interesting is that I've talked to quite a few experiences who the question I love to ask is, why do you think you had this experience? Why did this happen to you? And it might not even be about the experience. It might be about the whole physical side of it, the trauma afterwards, what they went through, the healing, the emotional healing, all these types of things. But as I ask, why do you think this happened to you? So often they say I was off my path, I was off my life purpose, and I needed a wake up call and I needed something to just push me back into part of the plan that is for my life. And I find this really, really interesting because I think we can stray from our life purpose. But also, yeah. I spoke I speak to a lot of people maybe who haven't had experiences who haven't felt like they've been born with any type of specific calling or gifting or anything like that. Mm -hmm. who who appear quite lost and don't know how to connect with the purpose. And I yeah. know that there'll be people listening right now who think, well, it's all good for you, but actually I don't know my life purpose. Oh yeah. And they might've spent time, you know, I say, go and be still and connect with God, with source, with, with your higher being, go and connect and just listen and see what messages come through. Oh yeah. It can be so hard if you feel like there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. What do it, you say to that? Have you got, well, because I don't I'll, know what to say to that. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, one of the things that, that I keep coming across in this searching for understanding life purpose is how incredibly significant the seemingly insignificant things are in our lives. I heard of an experience of, of one woman. She actually is in this near-death experience. She's talking to um, some guides and they're kind of uh, talking about, um, you know, life purpose and, and, and why, you know, why we come and why we do what we do. And, and, and she, and she has shown a man on the streets, just a homeless man. And, and they, they say to her, what do you see? And she says, I, I see a drunken bum. It just, you know, just mm. somebody living on the streets and let us show you something. And for just a brief moment, they have that man come out of his body. He's in a drunken stupor. So he's probably a brief near death experience for him. He's, he's <laughs> out of it, but his spirit comes out and it's this gloriously bright and, and incredibly spiritual man. And mm. she sees him just long enough to uh to then re return to his body and and they say now what do you see and and she's like what's going on here <laughs> that's just a drunken bum but got this incredible spirit inside him and they, they, she's like what what's going on with this she, and they tell him they tell her his whole purpose when he came to, to agreed to come to earth he agreed to take on an incredibly difficult assignment of living out a life on the streets because he would have the opportunity at one point to make eye contact with a man who could make a difference in the life of millions. And that oh, wow. eye contact that they would make would change that wealthy man's life and in return change the life of, of millions of others. And, and I'm just like, holy smokes. Yeah. If, if this one man can have one job, <laughs> you know, and it is to just live a difficult life and make eye contact with a certain person at the right time. And you can bet that this drunken man had no idea at the moment that that took place, that he just fulfilled his life purpose. You, you can bet he had no idea. And yet that small, seemingly insignificant thing changed millions of lives. I think yeah. our purposes in life, and I, I say life purpose, but I think it really comes down to purposes because I think we generally have quite a few and the small things that we do, sometimes it's, it's greeting someone, sometimes it's a brief conversation, sometimes it's just being there for, for someone when they needed somebody and it may seem insignificant at the time, those things really actually make a massive difference in when you, mm. when you can see that ripple effect. And some mm -hmm. people who have near-death experiences, they have this life review and they get to see that ripple effect. And they're like, holy mackerel, I had no mm. idea 
Mm. I had no idea, both for good and for bad. But mm. that that makes me feel like if we are striving to at least be open to whatever the universe, whatever God has in store for us, if we're at least open to that, you can bet we will be led to that purpose and probably yeah. <laughs> even more. Yeah, so. I, I do think so as well. And I think it would be so easy to look at that guy's life and think what a waste. Exactly. Without having that understanding of exactly. the huge picture. And yeah, totally. Like I think take time to go and sit and connect and try and identify the life purpose. But so mm -hmm. often it's the little things. And even if we have this great big plan, if we have a very specific purpose, some experiences come back and they say, well, I know exactly what it is I need to do. I was, I came back with a mission. I came back with instructions on what to do. And even if they go and do that, all of the little interactions that take place as they're doing that have the potential to change the world. So we can't yeah. underestimate these things, can we? And no. I love that you talk about the ripple effect as I was listening to you, I was going, oh yes, the ripple effect. So uh, Jeff Jansen actually talks a lot about this. He talks about life reviews and the ripple effects of all of the little moments. And he talks about the domino effect, about how all the dominoes are lined up. And if we can sometimes be the breaker where we just, uh, we are a domino and we can just step to the side and break the pattern, yeah. that so much can happen within that. And that on a physical level might look like, smiling at someone in the street and you know you hear this example all the time you think well what good does that really do it's such a small thing but if that person is having a really tough time and your smile just changes the degree of where they're at just brightens them up ever so slightly that might have then have another ripple effect that they don't quite do what they need to do or they smile at the next person or it can turn into this massive impact and you think a smile is just something so small, but it could actually change so much. And so when we consider the ripple effect and life reviews, looking at all of those things, that's where we can see that the smallest things actually had the biggest difference, which is exactly oh, yeah. what you're talking about with this guy on the street. It's amazing. Yeah. Wow. And I've, I've even um, been starting to develop, I, I, I guess you might say I, uh, uh, speculation or I, you know, I, I just wonder if this might be the case, but I'm, I'm really starting to think because sometimes you get, you also get the question of, well, if we're somehow, you know, fated or predestined to, to do these specific things, well, how does agency and, and choice come into the matter? And I, I'm, I'm starting to get this idea that it's very possible that that is one of the reasons that we can't know what our life purpose is quote unquote supposed to be because we have to choose it. But the cool thing about that is if that's the case, then what that means is in terms of, you know, when we're trying to figure out what is my, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What is my purpose? It may just come down to choose it, choose it now. Mm. Think now, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to, have the difference be that you make in this life. And it's totally okay if it's something simple. It's totally okay. You don't yeah. have to necessarily, you know, uh, be able to give TED Talks and, and travel the world. If you can, great, do it. But if, you, if, if your purpose is to help your mother who, is, who needs all this help, that is more than you think it is. And mm -hmm. taking that time to be still and and contemplate what, if you were given the choice now to have a life purpose, if you were, if, if God told you, what would you like to do as your purpose on earth? What would you choose? Why don't we take that approach? Why don't we take that approach and say, I'm going to choose to do this. And if yeah. it doesn't work out, well, I'll choose something else then. Because I yeah. think there's real power in using our agency for good. I, I think of another near-death experience, slightly bending the topic, but kind of not too, of a near-death experience of a, a boy at the time. He's an adult when he's telling the story, but, but he, he has this near-death experience and um, he's having a life review and look, and as he's going through this life review, um, different things in his life 
the the beings around him are either celebrating or kind of, you know, putting their arm around him saying, it's okay, you know, <laughs> you were learning and stuff for the hard things. And he says the thing that was one of the biggest celebrated moments in his life is he was, he was sent out to get a bucket of water. And he goes and he gets this bucket of water, fills up the bucket. And as he's about ha- part of the way back, he realizes he's got more in the bucket than he needs. And he, and so he can dump some of it out, make it easier to carry back. And he's about to dump it out, but then he, he, he looks over and there's this little dry patch of ground and there's this little teeny tree just kind of growing through a crack, a dry crack in the ground. And he's like, well, I'll just dump it there. And he goes and he pours it on the tree and, and then walks on, continues his life. He, he couldn't even remember this experience previous to this life review because it was so insignificant to him at the time. But he says when he's having life review and he, he takes that extra just couple, few seconds to go and pour it on the tree, he says the angels around him celebrated that almost like nothing else that he'd experienced. And he was like, why, what, what, what was up with that experience? And he was told because you were acting out of pure love. There was nothing in it for you, nothing in it for you, but you did it because you thought that tree would probably appreciate it. It was, it was just a sweet little kind childlike act. And it was celebrated because it was an act of love. And that tells me that, man, if we're, if we're making choices out of love, we're at least on the mm. right track. <laughs> totally. Yeah. For me, that's what it's about, isn't it? Living a life of integrity with love, in love. Yeah. Treating people really, really well. Not just people treating everything really, really well. Yeah. Mm. I love that. It's interesting what you say. Um, I wonder actually, yeah, we're looking for the big purpose, but what you said really really resonated with me about how if we could choose our purpose if we could choose that our purpose could be anything that we want what would we choose go and do that that resonates with me greatly because coming back from my experience from my illness coming back to a body that needed a, a bit of time and I guess dedication to it um through that I made the choice to squeeze the juice out of this life to absolutely Mm -hmm. live this life the best that I could. And I'm not talking going and trying every experience and skydiving and, you know, having every possible experience that there is, but really living a life that resonated with what my spirit felt, what my heart felt, trying to treat people really well, trying to just do the best that I could in this lifetime. And it's been quite an adventure. It's been a lot of fun, but I really love that. I think we can't really go too wrong if we're following the right intention, if we're trying to live in love and yet having this very physical experience. I wonder as well, I'm not convinced that we can fail this lifetime. You know, what if our purpose is just to smile at somebody at the right time, like you've talked about with the homeless man on the street. What if that is the whole purpose? I don't know that we die before our purpose is done. Mm -hmm. we can choose to end our life. And that's a whole different story to what I'm saying. Right, right. But I feel like we're given a big buffet, a platter. We can choose any option. We can choose whatever it is we want for our life. And that there are some predetermined parts along the way that we have to kind of complete along the way. Yeah. What do you think? I don't know that we can fail life. I don't know that we can get it wrong if we're living with the right intention. Yeah. And that is such an interesting uh, way of looking at it too, because, you know, sometimes when you start talking to people about how we're here to love and show love, um, they kind of assume that we mean this completely selfless, self-sacrificing, you know, um, put myself in pain in order to (laughs) serve others. And, and what I've found is uh, what I suspect is the case, and and you know my research seems to to point to this is that is that showing yourself love and having fun and and also helping others have fun and and enjoy life is an incredible act of love. In fact, yeah. you can do a lot more to bless other people if you are genuinely happy. I mean, it's it's actually very kind of difficult to serve other people if you're miserable because you're not giving yourself what you need. And, and so that, that 
need to, uh, you know, that overly self-sacrificing idea, I think is over overstated in so many ways that that's not what love is. Love is for everyone. You know, it's like, it's for you, it's for everyone else. And so when you, when you show yourself love and you show others love, you're living, like you said, you're just living it up. I mean, anyone who has a child knows the experience of dancing around the living room uh, to, with their child and how just fun it is. And then just, you know, it's like, I am showing love to you. I'm showing love to me. You're showing love to me. You're showing love to you. This is what life is about, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing. It all just bounces off everything, doesn't it? And it gets bigger and bigger and yeah, yep. laughter is a big thing for me. But interesting what you said there, because when you started saying that, I was going, oh, but it's self-love. So I think that part of, I've talked about this a little bit on my podcast, I think that part of my journey here is self-love because that's a really mm-hmm. hard part for me. But self-love does look like setting boundaries, putting things in place, yeah. saying no, pushing back on things. You know, it's not always the easy stuff. And you're right, people perceive love is just all that happy clappy stuff but it can actually be the raw painful yeah. not following what comes easy for you not following what would be the best choice it can be quite high start hard stuff so yes. totally but yeah l- laughter is a really big thing for me I think if we can have laughter in our life laughter is medicine for the soul laughter like it's been proven from a medical perspective that laughter helps to heal us it helps to change our vibration it helps to it changes our energy and it's contagious like I, when you were talking about being in the living room with the children or your child I mean you've got six kids so you know all about that and you know all about the harder part of love maybe yeah. some of the tough love there I don't know how you do that but <laughs> as you're doing that if you start to laugh and then you laugh and then you laugh and then another person laughs and you end up you all laughing and you can't even remember yeah. what you're laughing about And it's just so good for the soul. So I think, I think we need to pursue things in life that make us feel happy. We need to live with love, live with right intentional love. Mm -hmm. And yeah, do those things that just lift our energy, lift our vibration to make life good. Like you said, if we are genuinely happy, it's a lot easier to give out. And and like you say, with things being hard, sometimes I think it's incredibly good for us to do things that are incredibly difficult. I mean, oh, sitting out to do stuff that's like, there's almost no chance that this could work. Yeah. And yet diving into that and really, really giving it all. I've always been one who is of the opinion that it is better to love and have your heart broken than to never love. And I yeah. think that goes with, with just about anything. If there's something that you feel drawn to do, absolutely pursue it knowing that you very well could fail. Failure is, it offers some of the most powerful lessons in life. Nobody likes failure, but it's so part of life and part of success. And it's, you know, it's like we talked about with having children. There are, you know, some, some weeks, some months, there's more downs than ups, you know, yeah. and, oh, and it's yeah. like, but this is what we're here for. We're here to experience things totally. that we couldn't experience over there, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. I, I love what you say, because I don't think we can fail. And I don't think, you know, in failure moments, there's teaching moments and everything, there's two sides to everything is, is what I believe. Right. Right. And I think we we're so attuned to looking for the good stuff and focusing on the good stuff. Yeah. But I've kind of because I've been through some of the harder stuff, I sort of think, well, actually, that's where the goodness was. That's where the learning was. Yeah. It wasn't fun at the time. So I try and pursue things in my life that I'm either afraid of or that make me feel really like I want to run away from them. I don't know what the word is. I struggle with words. I struggle with my mind yeah. sort of lining okay. everything up. But you know, how does an athlete become an athlete? They get in there and they do the hard yards. They do the hard work. They do the part that's painful time and time again. And just because they're an athlete doesn't mean that it's easy. And I think if we can pursue some of the things in life that are a bit harder, then we get the reward from those things. And that's where we can have a fuller experience while we're here. So I think we're so used to running away from the bad things or the hard things. And 
I'm kind of on a bit of a mission in the last, well, I don't know, quite a few years actually, to pursue the hard stuff, to get up at the 5 a.m. thing, to follow yeah. the promptings that I have where I don't know what I'm doing or the hard stuff or make the hard decisions. And yeah. the results are always positive. It's, there's always value in that. And for me, pursuing the things that scare me and breaking through that fear, that is part of living this physical experience to the absolute full and squeezing the juice out of that life. So uh, and, there's and a lot I to would, do. I would even say to people, if, if the projects or uh, goals that you're making don't scare you just a little bit, you're probably setting your bar too low. <laughs> and you yeah, should probably... Yeah. Give yourself something that's going to stretch you because if there's one thing aside from love that it appears that we are here for, it is to learn and experience. And and it's in stretching that we do have those yeah. experiences and grow and learn things about ourselves that we couldn't have learned any other way. Absolutely. Oh, life is for living. Life is for living. This has been so interesting talking to you, Chaz. Thank you so Thank much. You, this has been is, so fun. Is there anything else that you want to add? Or I'm not quite sure how to do this. I don't. Oh, yeah. I just, I just love having this conversation. So thank you so much for this. I appreciate this. Yeah, I do as well. I think it's great. And I think it's really good to get together and just have a good old natter and let other people listen to our nattering. I think there's some value in that. And I just hope that our conversation will help impact one person and then I'm happy with that so yes, yeah too. Chaz thank you so much all the best with your podcast you're doing amazing work there um I'm going to put the links to that in the show notes for people to go and find out where you are oh, and yeah, yeah. great thank you so much thanks for joining me for another episode of the let's talk near death podcast don't forget to subscribe to stay updated with all of the events we have going on and to visit www.letstalkneardeath.com to join the VIP community.